Okay. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, I'm Elizabeth. I work at AJ. I'm joined by Laura from Bay Area School Choice. Um, we've worked together for years and it really feels like about time that we join forces <laughs> um, just to kind of help give you guys some information and help you navigate this process a little bit better because it can definitely be a little overwhelming and a lot. So we're going to go through a few things today. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves, go a little bit more in depth. We'll talk about what a complete application looks like, how you can write about your child, because there's a portion that you have to do yourselves. And then there's a lot that your students will have to do. So we'll talk about how you can best support them. Um, if it feels like a lot by that point, <laughs> we will go over how we can help you get through all of that. Uh, and then we'll leave time for questions at the end. I know I mentioned it in the email. Um, it's a little difficult to present and manage the chat at the same time. So feel free to drop things in the chat, but neither one of us will probably see it or respond to it until the very end of the presentation. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Shapiro. I um, started out as a classroom teacher at the Town School for Boys in San Francisco and at Convent of the Sacred Heart Elementary School in San Francisco. I taught for 10 years and was part of the admission team conducting kindergarten assessments. During that time, when I left the classroom, I thought I wanted to be an administrator and quickly realized I did not. Um, I stuck with um, a little bit of admissions and then also some development work. I became the director of alumni relations at the Branson School after spending a year in the Convent and Stuart Hall admission office. And I was um, on the team conducting ninth grade interviews at the Branson School. And then I left to start a family. And when my youngest started preschool, I fell into corporate relocation school placement, mostly down in Silicon Valley. So I feel oftentimes that I know the schools um, on the peninsula and South Bay better than the ones in my own backyard. But I've been doing relocation placement for 10 years and also working with local families like you who are looking for a little bit of help navigating the private school application process grades K through 12 for about 10 years as well. All right, and I am Elizabeth Emery. I have worked with AJ for almost seven years now. Um, I started as a regular academic tutor, but before that I had some classroom teaching experience as well and decided that I really kind of loved the one-on-one -on -one experience. I thought it it felt nicer. I felt like I could really impact kids a little bit more, um, get a little bit closer to them. Uh, so I started at AJ working one-on-one, -on -one, got a lot of experience with lots of different schools and sort of like the rigorous academics at all those schools. And as I worked my way up, I have been a director for about five years now, just navigating all of the different changes. I think something super unique that's happened in the last few years is the pandemic of course but almost every single year there's been a pretty significant change to the application process and sort of the different requirements for the kids so i feel like we've seen it all at this point um and we have a lot to share all right so we're going to start with what goes into a complete application there's a lot of pieces um but i think something that's really important to remember is that it's a big puzzle so while every piece is important it's also really important that they kind of work holistically i think laura can probably speak to that a little bit better than i can because she does more of it but i i think when we're looking at each component it's really easy to get hyper focused but it's also important to remember that it's part of something much bigger if you don't already have an account, the first place you have to start is Ravenna. So this is sort of like the common app of our local schools. All the schools are in there and you manage your entire application through there. It has all of the key dates. It's where you register for things like your test or your interview. Um, it's where you will ultimately submit your application for, from. It's where you'll find out about acceptances. So if you don't already have one, I would go in and do it tonight because most of the applications are already open. All right, so most of the people in this call are ninth grade focused, but we do have some middle school applicants as well. So I kind of, we put through a checklist so that you can see what applies to. 
All right, Laura, you want to switch off with these? Yeah, sure. Um, all of, no matter what grade level you're applying for, the schools are going to ask for uh, transcripts and activities that your student is engaged in after school. And a lot of times they'll ask for two years worth of transcripts. And this is for schools to see if there are patterns that emerge um, and to understand how your student is perceived in school by their teachers. And the um, after school activity piece or outside interests is really important. Um, like Elizabeth said, everything is, a, you know, they look at the whole picture, not just the individual puzzle pieces, but in after school activities and interests, they're, they're really looking for um, a range, you know? Um, and, and if you're hyper-focused on one particular sport, for example, if your student is the number one softball player in the state of California, that is great. Um, they also particularly like to see a range of interests. So does your student like to read, cook, help out with chores? These are all options in the drop-down menu of the activity form that you can um, include. I'm gonna let you take that one too. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so teacher recommendations are really, you know, important, especially uh, coming out of the pandemic. It is the school's insight, the schools you're applying to, it's their insight into your child in the classroom. Um, and they're, for ninth grade, you are limited to requesting letters of recommendation from your student's English teacher and math teacher. Those are the current English and math teachers. And then from the high school placement counselor at the elementary school where, or the middle school where your child attends or the principal. Um, and you have no input into that letter. You'll never see the letter, um, but it's important. So my recommendation is to have your student um, really get along with those teachers, especially. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next up is the online essay. So this gets a little bit confusing for our ninth grade applicants. And I got another slide after to kind of help clear it up a little bit. Um, this is a typed timed essay. So they will have to log online, type an essay. They'll get the prompt in the moment. Most of the time they have about 30 minutes to respond to this. Um, and it's totally, it's all done live. So all middle schools require it. And then the non-Catholic high schools also require this as a component. Um, it becomes extra important that this matches your child's writing later. Um, and I think this is actually probably a pretty big reason why they do it. It is the main reason why. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing that's new this year for our middle school applicants. So again, these are people, the grades at the top is what they're applying for is something called an analytical thinking exercise. Um, there's not a ton of information about it, but we know that it'll, it's 15 minutes and it will come immediately after their online essay. Um, it's going to be something where they have to explain their thought process, but we don't have much more information beyond that at, that, at this point. <laughs> um, it's like I said, there's something new every year and this has been our gift this year. <laughs> Okay, uh, entrance exams. So it used to be that everybody had to take a test. Most of the middle schools have gone completely test blind. Um, the high schools get a little bit more complicated. General rule of thumb is if a student is applying for ninth grade at a Catholic school, they will have to take the HSPT. Otherwise, they're test blind and they'll have to do that online essay in lieu of the entrance exam. Uh, some schools are test optional. I would say sort of like the recommendation there is if you think the performance on the test can offset something else in the application. So, if, you know, if a math grade is really low, but they can perform really well on the math section of the test, it's worth doing. Um, it's also something that you can take and then choose whether or not you want to use those scores. Want to do that one? 
Yes. So um, some schools are still requiring a one-on-one -on -one interview. Some schools are have moved to a group interview or two students at a time. Um, and some are having an activity where your child will be with three, four, five other students. They'll be given a task. Um, and in middle school, they typically have to complete the task like kind of alone, but using the other people as resources. And for ninth grade, it's typically a group activity. Um, and sometimes the activity is in addition to a one-on-one -on -one interview, and sometimes it's in lieu of. So um, just make sure every school has slightly different options and requirements, and it's just important to keep checking Ravenna to make sure you're um, registering for everything you need to. One thing I should have mentioned, um, the online essay analytical thinking exercise and entrance exam are all done once and sent out to the various schools, whereas an interview or some of these other things, you'll, they'll have to do it every school. Mm -hmm. Application essays is something they have to do at every school. So this is sort of where that online essay comes into play. Um, the application essays are something that you'll be given as soon as you choose to apply for the school. You'll have many months to work on it and polish and perfect it, but they want to be able to see what the students can do on their own in a timed setting when things don't have as much room for editing and polishing. So every school will have some amount of application essays. I think it's usually like two to five. Um, and I've used the word essays on this slide, but really they're like responses because a lot of them are character limit or word count limit. Um, so kind of varies by school what they're about or how many they have to do, but it's definitely something that you can find on Ravenna. And then this would be the parent essays. So I'll let you tackle that one. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, the parents are also required to write somewhere between two and five statements um, about their child and also um, a little bit about how you participate in your community. I'm going to talk at length about this a little bit later in the presentation. Okay, so just a quick recap for all of the people with eighth graders applying to ninth grade. If your student is applying to a Catholic school, they will have to take the HSPT. There are two exceptions to that. Sacred Heart Prep and Woodside Priory are not accepting HSPTs. They're doing the online essay instead. And then all of the independent high schools, so think like Menlo, um, Castilea, they're doing the online essay. Something worth noting about the HSPTs, they're split. They're usually in December or January. And you have to take it at the school that's offering at the earliest. So a really good example of this is Sarah in St. Francis. If your son is applying to Sarah, the test is December 2nd. If they're applying to St. Francis, there's two options at the end of January. You can't choose to submit the end of January scores and have more time to kind of prepare because Sarah won't accept those scores. They have to do the earlier test date and let Sarah send the scores over to St. Francis. So we had a little bit of confusion with that last year and some people scrambled and panicked because they had, thought they had a few more weeks than they did to prepare. So definitely something to be aware of this year. This is me. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, um, okay. So um, my biggest tip um, when you're doing your writing is make sure you're highlighting in, um, in the essays what you're, what the schools are looking for. You can usually learn a little bit more about what the schools are looking for as you go to the admission events. Um, each school has their own flavor. And I'll talk about some more tips, I think, on the next slide. So there are three general um, themes to all of the parent essays. And each school asks them in slightly different ways. But luckily, uh, there are components from every school that you'll be able to copy and paste and tailor to that particular school. The one exception, of course, is why this particular school. Every school wants to know why you want to send your child to that school. 
Um, the, another general a general question is, uh, describe the strengths and areas for growth that your child exhibits, and then how do you as parents participate in your community, either in the school or outside the school? So the why this school question, my tips are be extremely specific, use examples from your event experiences. If your child loves to build, um, talk about the design lab at that particular school. If your child is passionate about English, talk about the, the class that you visited and some give an example of something that the teacher said or you heard another student say. Um, also, make sure to include not only academic, but also um, social emotional experiences that you see in your child. If your child um, is very social and has a lot of interest and you think they might join some different clubs, then you can use an example of a club that you heard about or read about on the website and why you think your child would be interested in that particular club in that particular school. Um, and if your child is very social or not social, talk about what you're seeing or experiencing on the campuses that will help your child. Um, and then the third tip is also when you're talking about a growth opportunity, um, show how that specific school will help your student grow and um, just use as many short examples as you can. There's usually a word count limit um, but even if you throw in two sentences that are very specific, that's what the schools are looking for. For the strengths and areas for growth, again, use examples. Show what you're talking about. Don't say, my child is ahead two years in math. Talk about the kinds of problem, math problems that your child likes to engage in or their favorite book that's, you know, something that's a high school level book and why they like it. Um, I would pick two or three strengths and one area for an improvement. So I talked a little bit about um, there's different types of strengths. There's academic, which I mentioned, there's social emotional, and then there's like a citizenship strength. Does your child how does your child contribute to the world in your house are they helpful do they cook dinner do they help a sibling with their homework what about um outside of the house are they empathetic do they help strangers do they volunteer so um make sure you're taking examples from all different um types of strength areas and then choose a growth area that's developmentally appropriate. So, um, you know, if you, is your child um, struggling with um, executive functioning? That's totally normal. Um, or do they need to advocate more for themselves? Um, those are those are very typical uh, growth areas. And then something that you can add when you're talking about this growth area is what you're doing at home or at school to help your child overcome or grow in this area so that you show the schools you wanna be a partner. And the last kind of general question is how do you contribute to the community? Schools really want parents who are gonna partner with them and um, you know, participate and be active. Um, this is also your chance to brag. So if you are um, a venture capitalist who primarily invests in female-run companies, or um, if you volunteer at the hospital, you know, this is your, the only chance really, at the ninth grade level, there aren't a lot of parent interviews. And so this is your chance to humbly brag about your accomplishments. Um, they also wanna know how active you are in your current school community. So um, you can talk about what roles you play there. Is it, you know, showing up to a potluck or helping out a teacher? Um, and then if you volunteer outside of school, of course, be sure to mention your role in your community. Um, and then you can, if you feel like you have skills or an area of expertise that you could uh, bring to add value to the school community, then be sure to 
to discuss that there. Cool. Okay. So talking about ways that you can support your student with the parts of the application that they have to do, I think this visual is probably something that's familiar to everyone. Um, I know as parents, you have a lot of advice, a lot of thoughts that you want to offer, and the kids, particularly at this age, simply do not want to hear it. So I think this is a process that can be a bit anxiety provoking and can be really frustrating. Um, it's also hard and you know they just might not want to do it because it's hard and that's very very normal so first i would say use a light touch and what i mean by that is like find ways to make it not super naggy um the biggest most important thing i i know we've touched on this already but like really resist the urge to over edit um because they have that online proctored writing sample it's going to be very, very obvious to the schools if you have over edited or over helped their application essays themselves. And that's like not a super great look. Remember, academic dishonesty is something that they take very, very seriously. And if it appears as though you have written the essays for your student because it really doesn't match the essay they were able to do on their own, it's going to be super obvious. Uh, the other thing I think this is really important for <clears throat> is an interview. So interviews should be very conversational, should be supernatural. And if kids come in with something that feels very scripted and robotic, it's going to look weird, but it's also like going to be an uncomfortable experience for the interviewer and it might not make the best impression. Kids have a really hard time bragging about themselves and they have a really hard time thinking about things that have happened in their lives. And I think this is an area where you can really jump in and help. Um, I, I've talked to so many kids that will just offhand mention that they did something and it's like one of the coolest things I've ever heard. And they just think it's totally normal and it doesn't occur to them how neat that experience is. Um, and then also, like I said, they have a really, really difficult time bragging about themselves. So when it comes to the questions where it says, you know, talking about their personal strengths or talking about areas where they've been able to grow um, those are conversations that you can have with them that are really positive and you might get a little eye roll because they think you have to say that but it, it still is a positive experience as opposed to feeling like very naggy or critical i also think it's really important to work together something that i have learned over the last however many years of working with kids they will do so much more when there's personal buy-in from them. So for example, when I'm matching up a tutor with a student for the first time, I will send, especially like if I hear a parent say that the kid's a little reluctant to come to tutoring, I send two recommendations and encourage the student to look at both of them and choose between the two so that they felt that they've had some agency in the process. You can do the same thing here maybe create a schedule that they agree on with deadlines so that when it comes time to hold them to it, it's something that they have also decided felt reasonable. And then I think the last thing here is really let them be ourselves, be themselves. I think we have a tendency to kind of want to like make our really excited boisterous kids calm down a little bit or super shy kids. We want them to come out of their shells. There's a place for everybody at these schools. Schools want the next leaders, but they also want the next thinkers. So find ways to help them be the best versions of themselves so that it feels authentic and that they feel confident, and but it's still them. Next up would be <laughs> lean on professionals. We're here for a reason. Uh, we can provide a lot of guidance, both tutors and counselors, um, and we can also do the nagging for you. Everything is so much better received coming from us than coming from you. Part of that is because you're a safe space emotionally. Part of that is because there's maybe a shorter fuse at home. Um, but when we remind kids to do something, we don't get nearly the same amount of pushback. And what that means is that you can support them with the homework and the tasks that we assign, and you're back to working together instead of being the ones forcing them to do it. Um, so if you've made that schedule together, that helps. But if I send home homework and you're just saying like, hey, Elizabeth gave you this homework you have to do. I'm the bad guy and that's fine. All right.
So gonna kind of run through some of the things that we can provide to help you with the whole process. So because I've been doing this for a long time, I also stay up to date with schools and programs that they change or improve. I go on tours, I talk with admission directors. I can really help you find what your right fit schools might be. That's really my um, personal philosophy is helping families find right fit learning environments for their students. I also have tips and tricks for staying connected with admission teams. I can help parents with their statements. I can help students with their statements. Um, we can do interview and activity prep. And at the end of the admission cycle, there is a strategy in writing a first choice designation letter um, and also sending what I like to call love letters to the other schools that you're applying to. So I can help with that. Cool. And then AJ, we prepare for anything that happens live. The only exception to this, I will say, is if you're working with a counselor like Laura, a lot of this should be done with her. Um, so certainly the tests. Um, we can help prepare for the interviews, but I think if you have done a bunch of research with somebody, they have a lot more information than we do and might be a better resource for the interviews. Um, we definitely helped with the time writing sample. I think this is an area that every single student needs support with. Uh, there is an art to a five paragraph essay and there's an art to doing it in a timed setting. Uh, you would be surprised just how much more polished an essay can look with a little bit of a formula and how many different things can all have the same handful of acceptable answers to help kids adapt and brainstorm really quickly. Um, there's that analytical thinking exercise. We don't know a lot about it, but I think a huge, huge skill here that's also really difficult is being able to articulate your thoughts. So that's definitely something that we can help get kids good at and just sort of get them thinking about their own thoughts a little bit. Um, we can certainly help keep things age appropriate. So if you're starting to worry that you're over editing or, or something like that, we can jump in and take a look. We are looking at tons of essays written by 10 to 13 year olds all day, every day. So we're pretty good at assessing that. So that would be your application essays. But again, if you're working with somebody like Laura and you want to make it really specific, tailored to the school, that would be more her domain. We're also very organized. There's a lot going on in this process and we can help you keep track of all of the moving parts and make sure that you're super prepared for each step of the way as it comes up. Um, if you registered for a test at the end of, or a, a time writing sample at the end of October, it sounds very far away, but I promise it will sneak up on us. Um, and if you're meeting with somebody just once a week to check in or once every other week, that's really only a couple hours of progress. And then the last thing that we haven't really touched on here is academic reinforcement. So at some point, everybody's going to have to go through a transition. And if you're trying to get into one of the really elite private schools in the area, it's going to be a pretty rigorous transition. So this is a really good time to start preparing and solidifying things like math foundations, making sure their writing is strong, understanding how study skills work and getting better at executive functioning type stuff. Um, because we're about to really kick it up a notch. And I think there's a lot of stress and anxiety in any change in schools, but it can be that much harder if the academic standards are much, much higher than kids are used to and they don't feel quite prepared. All right, so go ahead and drop some questions in the chat. While you guys are thinking, I wanted to run through the questions that you put in your response when you registered. So we'll run through a few of those uh, and then jump over to the chat. So Laura, I'm gonna let you take this one. Is yeah. there weighted importance for each part of the application? Is one part more important than other? Um, not really because um, if the student has, you know, something that is, jumping out at the reader on the transcript, they'll go to the teacher recommendations to see what the teacher has to say about that specific issue. Um, it really is 
the puzzle and they're looking at everything put together. That being said, the teacher recommendations are really important um, and they're the only piece of the process that neither Elizabeth or AJ nor I ever has access to. Um, and they're kind of a wild card because a lot depends on the teacher who's writing it. They don't necessarily know what some trigger words might be for different readers. Um, but also schools understand that in each piece of the puzzle, they're seeing a small snapshot of your child. And so they're trying to look at the whole picture when put together. Cool, okay. Does St. Francis have the timed essay? So St. Francis is a Catholic high school, which means that they have the HSPT. However, <laughs> at the end of the HSPT, depending on the school, depending on the year, there is a, an essay response. So I think maybe <laughs> I have the answer here, um, but it is something that can be prepared for. And then our kids and parents interviewed at St. Francis. Kids for sure. Laura, do you know if St. Francis does parents? I don't think so. Okay. Oh, the video. Do you have thoughts on that? I have some. Um, I do. Yeah, so it depends. Some of the schools are doing this one-way video um, where you don't know the prompt until you log in. And then some schools are asking you to create a video. Um, the video, I don't know which one the person is referencing, but if for the videos that you have to create, I would kind of depends on the question, but try to include information that is not being represented anywhere else in the application. So don't make a video of something that your student talks about in their essays. Do it about something else. Yeah. Um, I would also say like, that's another one to really resist the urge to over edit on, especially if, like if you get to try multiple times and then choose what you submit. Um, they're looking for authenticity and they're looking for kids who feel like kids. Um, okay, any tips on how important it is to have extracurricular activities in your application? I would say, yes, it's important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what should people do if they don't have many to add? I think you can also add interests. You know, um, if your child is really into technology and knows everything about the latest Apple products, you can write about their passion for that. There's not a class or an after school activity that they can take. Um, or if they built a PC on their own, that's not a class or a team. You know, I think there's um, lots of ways to show what your kids' interests are that aren't um, the typical sports teams or drama or, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's another one too that I think like, <laughs> we think we're so boring, but there really <laughs> could be something that you do as a family every weekend or something like right. that that can be really cool to the schools. Because remember, they're big on things like family values or community or like there could be a lot of things that just feel so normal to us, but that actually could be a really neat part of the application for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, preparing students for interview or shadow days. Well, those, I mean, they're different. Interview, for sure, I would say kids should be doing a good amount of research about the school ahead of time because they will be asked about the school, they will be asked about their interest in the school, and then a component that should not be forgotten, they'll ask, they'll say, do you have any questions for me? And the kids should have questions prepared about some type of program or some class or some offering that the school had, just something that shows that they have done a little bit of digging and have like a greater interest in the school. Um, Anything about shadow days? Um, again, I think it's important to review uh, the information that you have about that particular school and have your student come up with questions for their host um, that can be very general. You know, what's lunch all about? Um, you know, do, how does, do you have a mentor or a homeroom teacher or advisor? How does that work? You know, something that can just start a conversation. Yeah, for sure. I think the other thing about shadow days um, that maybe is not considered as often as it should be is it really is an experience for the student to feel out the school themselves. 
it doesn't feel like it, but it is a two way street. And if they show up to the shadow day and hate it, like that's part of the experience and that's part of why they have a shadow day. So if, you know, if the vibes are off and they can't necessarily articulate it, but they really just couldn't see themselves there, that's okay too. That happens all the time. You know, yeah. you think that you have your student is a more traditional learner and they get to a very traditional school where it's mostly lecture and note taking and they have a visceral reaction to it and they go to a more progressive school where it's more group work and it's a surprising, you know, realization or vice versa. So yeah. I, I mean we see it happen with kids all the time too. Like we'll have kids come in and they'll be like dead set on a school and they're so excited and then they come back from the shadow day and they're like Oh, <laughs> um, so it really, really is useful information for you as well. I'll say one more thing about that is that schools find it difficult to have enough um, student ambassadors or tour guides yeah. for the number of kids that come through on the shadow days. And not all student ambassadors and tour guides are created equal. And so if your child is dead set on a certain school and they don't have a good experience, I would try to have additional, not visit days, but go to any on-campus event that you can attend um, and talk to other people who have students at the school to see if that was a one-off or if it's a theme. Yeah, that's solid advice. Okay, will students with learning differences be treated differently when they look at the application? Um, I don't, how I'll let Laura answer the application part of that, but kind of an answer that maybe you weren't expecting. I think it's actually really, really important to let the schools know if there's a test because they can receive accommodations for the test and that can make a world of difference. Um, and a lot of the schools have really great programs for students with learning differences and it can be a reason why some students end up there. Um, so I would not withhold information that could earn a student accommodations on an exam uh, if you think that they could get it. I absolutely agree. Also, schools are looking to build a balanced class. They don't only want the top academic, academic performers. They want kids with a variety of different learning styles and learning needs. And, um, you know, I don't think anyone with a difference would be treated any other way other than, you know, looking at as a regular candidate, as long as the accommodations are pretty typical, like preferred seating, extra time, ability to use a calculator, you know, if um, there are more severe differences, again, it's very important to talk with the school about that. You don't want to put your student in a situation where they can't be supported, and the school wants to make sure that they can support your student. Is there a website about how to quickly compare schools and find information about what the different schools offer um, and how to figure out which school is best for your child? Not, not that I have found. It's a million dollar business idea. I get asked that question every day, practically. Mm -hmm. um, and I caution against looking at sites like niche.com or great schools because people who post tend to be very upset or very happy. Um, and what might upset one family about a school might make another family really happy. So it's all, you know, everyone's looking at these schools through their own lens. So I just recommend taking everything you see online and even things that you hear from colleagues or parking lot conversations with a grain or 10 of salt. <laughs> I have also seen a few websites that try and like rank schools or compare schools, um, but they're doing it all over the nation. So I don't know that they really have like the inside scoop necessarily on our schools in particular. Uh, okay, let's see, there's one over here. Can you explain more about sending a letter, letting the school know they're the student's top choice versus the love letters you mentioned? Um. Admission de departments are concerned with their yield. So that means how many students accept the offers that they give out on decision day. And so, um, you know, one of my tips and tricks is sending, having the student, uh, no matter the age, send a note to the admission team 
with one more new example of why that's the right school for them. Is that, would you do that for a wait list as well? You do that before decisions come out. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, a couple questions about how to make accomplishments stand out or sound unique in the personal statement. Um, my two cents here is that it, it's less about the accomplishments or the experiences, because again, we're talking about 10 to 13 year olds. They have not had a lot of time to develop unique experiences or things like that. But I think it's a lot more about like letting your kid be your kid and just letting their voice shine through and sort of like the way that they interpret their accomplishments and experiences and the way that they talk about them more so than like what the experiences are themselves. I don't know if you have a differing opinion or anything to add there. That's great. Okay, cool. Uh, advice on how to choose the right school. I think we've kind of touched on it generally, maybe not specifically, but I think research, visits, what else? You get a feeling, you get like a gut feeling. Um, there's so many good choices in the area, including public schools. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know that there's always only one right school. Yeah, I think definitely like the the visits are huge and kind of just watching how kids interact. If there are older kids that you can talk to and, and sort of see how they feel about the school or even just like observing <laughs> how stressed the kids seem, how excited the kids seem, just, you know, looking at the student body and trying to envision yourself or your student there. When you know your your student as well, if they're not, you know, so um, uh, if, if a school that is more well-rounded rather than focusing on academics and having a lot of pressure is better than their schools to avoid, if um, your child wants that challenge, um, uh, there's school different schools to look at if you're you know looking for a very special music program you know you just have to kind of think about what the flavor of each of these schools is and does that align with your family values and your child's wants and needs mm -hmm. okay struggling with over editing do we let kids send in applications with a spelling error do we make suggestions for other words or grammar that could be chosen um, yeah, it's definitely a balance, and I think that that is something that can be good to consult someone on. Um, we have rubrics that we use, so we can kind of run through a checklist to help kids determine if their writing is sort of up to the standard of, of what we would expect at that grade level. Um, I would do it in Google Docs, <laughs> so you don't have to be the one to point out a spelling error. Um, and that I, I think like the biggest thing, I wouldn't necessarily switch words because our vocabulary is going to be quite different than theirs. Um, same thing with grammar, like there's certain punctuation things that maybe they have or haven't learned. Um, the only thing I would really step in on is if something doesn't make sense. If you read a sentence and you don't know what they mean, or if you could give it to your neighbor who didn't have the same experiences and your neighbor wouldn't know what they're referring to, that would probably be something to clear up. But ultimately, like switching out words, switching out sentences, making things sound more complex makes things sound like it was written by somebody older. Uh, do you have a general range of how many recommended schools to apply to? It depends on what your anchor school is or if you're okay with your public school. Um, I recommend typically uh, between no more than six uh, schools. Yeah. I will say um, because everybody is all applying to the same schools, the wait lists tend to be very fluid, right? So if, if I apply to five and Laura applies to five and I get waitlisted at five, she can only choose one. So I'm also gonna move up on all four of the wait lists that she didn't accept. Um, what we see at AJS, the most disappointments come from kids who only apply to one school. If you put all your eggs into one basket, um, it, it, 
you know, it, it can make things a little bit riskier for sure. Um, and generally when people do that, it tends to be one of the more popular schools to begin with. Yeah. So um, let me see if there's anything else that we haven't touched on. Um, I think we covered managing stress pretty well. I also think it's important to just keep in mind that it's a stressful process and it's important. It's like impossible to completely eliminate the stress or the frustration. Um, and ultimately it is a, a an intense experience, but a learning experience for kids, you know, sitting through an interview at 10 or 13 will make it that much easier when they decide to go get a job or when they have to do, if they apply to a private college that requires interviews, it, it, it's just like all part of a learning experience. Yeah. Any advice on open houses? Um, yes. Um, that's kind of an open-ended question, but I would say if you go to an open house, walk in, talk to your family about what you're looking for. Um, in a school, have those kinds of discussions and then see if that school checks the boxes. I would try to talk to teachers um, to get a sense of how they teach and what kind of learners thrive in those environments. And if you can make a connection with someone from the admission team, um, do that. But really, it's your only chance to, um, as to see the schools in action and be on campus and um you know like i said you do get a feeling um about whether you can see your family there or not okay and then a couple questions about timelines so i applications are open so like i said if you have not created an account on ravenna do that tonight um <laughs> and honestly like the timeline kind of manages itself if you have to you have to register for different events and things like that so i think a lot of it will set itself as you go in and register for things like the interview the test um a shadow day at an open house but it definitely is something that you should pace yourself through i would say yeah right now it's sort of the exploratory phase where you're learning about all the different schools um you might drop a couple uh, by the time it's time to complete the applications i would note that the catholic schools except for sacred heart and priory have a earlier deadline for their essays so as soon as you know for certain that you want to apply to a specific school i recommend getting to work on the essays um there's no benefit to submitting them early and there's also no harm in submitting them early schools will not look at uh they won't start reading applications until after the submission date and then even at least a week maybe two after that because they're putting all the pieces together and getting everything ready to have the applications be read thanks okay I think that just about covers it. Uh, we'll stick around for a few more minutes in case anybody wants to ask any other questions, but thank you very much for coming. Uh, and we will send out a recap with ways to reach us in case you are feeling like you need a little reinforcement through the process.